Hi, everyone. Um, it's Susan. I want to thank everyone out there for joining us this evening. We're here today to talk about the COVID-19 vaccine, how it's being distributed, and answer your questions about what you need to know about it. Um, so before we discuss the vaccine, I wanted to touch upon what happened in Washington, D.C. last week. Um, an armed mob incited by the sitting president of the United States stormed into the U.S. Capitol and attempted to stop Congress from carrying out its constitutional duty to certify the presidential election results. Before last week, I could never have imagined the violence and lawlessness that I saw in the Capitol. And I know Americans watched in horror as this violent mob beat down the doors to the very embodiment of our democracy. So like many of you, this dark moment has left me heartbroken and deeply disturbed, and there needs to be accountability. Accountability for the people who perpetrated this violence, accountability for the security officials who left the, cal the Capitol so vulnerable, knowing that this was coming, and accountability for the president who violated his oath of office by encouraging these attacks on the Capitol and Congress. Turning back to our other national crisis, I know this is a difficult and unpredictable time for everyone in our community. Um, we've been dealing with this virus for nearly a year and we're all eager to go back to normal life as quickly and as safely as possible. There is finally a light at the end of the tunnel with these vaccines and that should bring us all hope for brighter days ahead. Um, as we have our discussion, if you have questions that you'd like us to answer today about the vaccine, please leave them in the comments below and we'll try to get to as many as possible. And I wanna thank folks who sent questions in ahead of time as well. Um, I wanna briefly highlight what we're doing at the federal level to provide more resources for our communities. In December, Congress passed a $900 billion COVID-19 relief package. This included $600 stimulus checks for qualified Americans, $300 per week, in renewed unemployment assistance and $284 billion in small business loans. Uh, my office is updating our COVID-19 resource guides with new information um, put in place from this package and how to access these resources. So we have guides that have focused on employment, small business, healthcare providers, educators, tribes, veterans, and more. And you can find these guides on my website, which is delbene.house.gov. We have a COVID-19 tab and we'll include a link in the comments so you can go there so that we can update the information and you can go there for, um, to, to look for any um, information you may need. This deal is important, but there's more we need to do. And I look forward to working with my colleagues and with the new Biden-Harris administration to provide more resources that provide relief to our workers, communities, small businesses, and make sure that our healthcare community has the resources they need to continue to combat this outbreak. The deal also included $73 billion for the public health response that will help us produce and redistribute the vaccine. Um, Washington has already begun giving out the vaccines and I've received many questions from the community that we're going to answer as, and we're gonna answer as many as we can. Joining me today are Dr. Jeff Tomlin, who's the CEO of Evergreen Health, and Dr. Francis Rito, the Medical Director of Infection Control and Prevention at Evergreen Health. Um, I wanna thank both of them for being here. Evergreen has been on the front line of this pandemic since the very beginning, carrying some of the first COVID-19 patients in the country. So thank you both um, for all that you and your staff are doing and for joining us today. Um, a reminder that if you have questions about the vaccine, please leave them in the comments and we'll be answering this, them soon. And with that, I want to turn it over to Dr. Tomlin um, for some opening remarks. And thank you again, Dr. Tomlin, for being here. Congresswoman Delbeni, thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, be a part of this. It's certainly our first Facebook Live event and very <laughs> grateful uh, to be a part of it. Uh, it does seem like ages ago since you showed up on the first week of March to see how Evergreen Health was doing in that first week of the pandemic. Uh, and uh, he, that evening of February 28th is etched in all of our memories when uh, Dr. Rito discovered that the virus was in, in uh, some of our patients in the hospital uh, from the, the life care center. And he called our chief medical and quality officer, Dr. Tori Palazzo to let him know 
uh, that uh, we had the virus in the hospital and that set off a series of events that uh, really haven't stopped in those 10 months. And so deploying PPE and setting up the facility and uh, setting up the command center. And in, and in the midst of all that, uh, that first week, we had a number of organizations that were a little afraid to, of Evergreen Health. And so we had people from the media and others who were a little skeptical about coming into the facility, but Congresswoman, you showed up and uh, courageously came in and said, what can, what can I do to help the uh, Evergreen Health? And uh, so grateful um, and uh, we're uh, forever in your debt for making sure that some of those supplies were showing up when some people were skeptical of that. So, so thanks so much for your uh, uh, part in that. So over that time, we've obviously learned a lot about the virus and there's so much more to learn as well. I think the the, uh, the speed of, with which uh, all this is happening is probably not fast enough for most everybody, but but at the same time, you think about how far we've come from not having any uh, uh, very limited ability to do testing to, you know, even our organization is doing sometimes more than 400 tests a day. Uh, and now the, the, uh, the very important uh, phase of uh, vaccinations. And so there's a lot of excitement within the organization that we actually are gonna be proactive now to actually hopefully change the course of this. And so that's really the purpose I think of this evening is to uh, hear from Dr. Rito and for the uh, public to answer, uh, ask us questions about uh, where we are in terms of vaccination and, and where uh, we see that happening. So again, uh, uh, very proud of the, the team here at Evergreen Health and the work they've done, but it's my great privilege to introduce Dr. Francis Rito, who I feel like a warm up back now, Frank, you're, you're <laughs> quite famous from PBS to CNN to all the media outlets. And uh, uh, he's done a great job of, of, of informing the public and he's just such a great am ambassador uh, on this subject. So uh, Frank, uh, off to you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman Del Benny. Thank you for uh, organizing and hosting this, uh, Dr. Tomlin. Uh, and uh, just a quick uh, shout out and recognition to the great team here at Evergreen Health. Uh, and to Public Health Seattle King County, uh, who have been partners with us uh, uh, from the very start. I, I think it's difficult to believe that it's been uh, just a little over a year, January 8th, uh, 2020, when the sequence of this virus was announced. Test kits were available at the Centers for Disease Control on January 17th, and the very first case was identified in the United States at Providence Hospital up in Everett. Uh, and had been followed there, a traveler returning. We identified the first two cases uh, that were being transmitted within the United States. These are individuals who had not traveled on February 28th, and uh, the rest was just an explosion of, of uh, individuals who became infected, and it became apparent that it had been circulating for quite some time uh, in the U.S., uh, we've moved through all the trials of testing and PPE supply, uh, the summer surge and now the winter surge, uh, and here we are less than, uh, less than 10 months later since it appeared in the United States, we now have a vaccine. And this is, this is really, uh, I think, going to be what is necessary to stop this uh, pandemic. Uh, I've, I've mentioned and I've said this many times, there's only one way off this roller coaster and it's immunity. And you're either going to become immune because of infection or because of vaccine. And by far the preferable approach is to get your vaccine and become immune in that fashion. So we're very happy. Uh, uh, we received our first doses of Moderna vaccine on December 23rd. Uh, we worked hard on Christmas Eve um, up until eight o'clock and uh, put out uh, almost 610 doses of vaccine that day to our healthcare team uh, and have been uh, immunizing since then. Uh, we've now uh, passed out over 5,000 doses, uh, the majority to our healthcare workers and to healthcare workers in our community, to EMS and first responders. So uh, it's, it's been gratifying to see the response uh, and we hope to continue this pace uh, to get vaccine out to everybody uh, that needs it as expeditiously as possible. Absolutely, thank you, thank you both. Um, I'm, we have a bunch of questions here um, from folks, and I'm going to start with one from Rocchio from Bellevue. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, the question is, 
And I think this is for you, Dr. Rito. What are the main differences in efficacy of the vaccines? And maybe you want to describe the different vaccines that are out there right now. Sure. Currently, there are two vaccines that have been uh, approved or issued under an emergency use, use authorization uh, by the, the uh, Food and Drug Administration. And they are both messenger RNA vaccines. In a way, this is uh, like uh, putting in the blueprints for the protein that you need. And maybe just a quick word about vaccines in general. They usually take a, a sugar or, or a protein that's very specific for the virus or bacteria that you're, you're trying to immunize against. And they use that as the vaccine. And so you either get a purified sugar or protein, or you get the whole cell. And uh, in this case, they've actually gone back one step further and they've actually obtained the blueprints, uh, the messenger RNA for this protein. And they're using the body, body's cellular machinery to create the antigen that, that will ultimately produce the immune response. It's an incredibly elegant uh, process. So the two currently available, one is by Pfizer and one is by Moderna. Uh, they're very similar uh, in their composition. They're both messenger RNA vaccines. And uh, they came up with surprisingly very similar efficacy uh, uh, numbers, about 95%. It's two doses. And uh, the Pfizer uh, vaccine is three weeks apart and the Moderna vaccine is four weeks apart. And you do need to get both doses to get to that 95% uh, efficacy number. So it's important if people start that they finish up and get the second dose. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's a follow-up question um, to that um, the, the, about the safety of the vaccines. Um, you know, People ask you know, if they're safe, um, if they should have any concerns, are there any side effects that they should be worried about? Right. The vaccines have, have proven to be very safe. There have been over 5 million doses, probably 6 million doses by now distributed. Uh, the most serious side effect that's being observed is anaphylaxis or an allergic type reaction at a rate of around 11 per million doses distributed. And that's of the Pfizer vaccine. The Moderna vaccine is comparable. We're also seeing some allergic reactions. And that's one of the reasons we're doing them in a carefully monitored situation uh, so that if anybody has that type of reaction, they can be dealt with quickly. Other than that, it's the typical sort of vaccine reactions that you'd expect. Sore arm, sometimes redness around the arm. Some people get achy and have low-grade fevers. And that's really a representation of your immune system responding to the vaccine. It's nothing to be alarmed about. Um, and uh, usually you can tough it out and not take anything. If you're really uncomfortable, we recommend some ibuprofen or acetaminophen to help deal with the symptoms. And um, you said it's a messenger RNA vaccine. I used to, I started my career doing immunology research. So it's fascinating to me to see what's happening. But um, in terms of, from the patient standpoint, in terms of getting a vaccination, um, how different are these vaccines, if anything, from getting a flu shot? So there, there are some differences in, in, the, in the type of vaccine that's being created here. This is uh, one of the first messenger RNAs, uh, vaccines that have been issued widely, but it's not the first. There were messenger RNA vaccines against Zika and chikungunya viruses. So this is a, a platform that's been uh, established and tried in the past. It's a little bit different than the flu shot. Mostly the flu shots are virus, the entire virus uh, that's uh, grown up in eggs and then purified uh, and inactivated. That's one method. And there are multiple other strategies that have been used for, for different types of flu vaccines. So we're seeing a broad array of platforms uh, and there are more that are coming for, um, for the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, including uh, what are called vectored vaccines. I'm sure people have heard of this. It's the Pfizer, I'm sorry, the uh, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, where they use another virus and they just insert the genetic material uh, to try and elicit an immune response. And there, there are a variety of different uh, strategies uh, that have been employed. And uh, you'll, you're seeing this all over the world. I think at last count, there were over 100 uh, vaccines in different formulations. 
Um, and you answered this a little bit. There we had a question from Mercy from Redmond who asked, um, looks like providers are giving contradicting information about the second shot. Is there a need for two doses? Obviously there's a need that you're talking about. The time frame may be different between, depending on what vaccine you get. Yes, and I think it's absolutely important to stress that you do need the second dose uh, of vaccine in order to achieve maximum uh, benefit. And it's, it's not just the antibodies, but it's also the cellular immunity uh, that seems to be enhanced by these vaccines. And it actually uh, it appears that the vaccines produce a stronger immune response even than natural infection does. Um, so I think there's benefit, but it is important to stress that you need to get that follow-up dose. Um, Dr. Tomlin, we're gonna move to you um, here and uh, asks after people get the vaccine, can they stop wearing masks and, or stop social distancing? Yeah, I think it's gonna be some time before somebody uh, rings the all clear bell, Congresswoman. Uh, clearly, as the vaccine works and Dr. Rigo's mentioned, it's gonna be given in, in two separate doses. And it really is until that sixth week where uh, people have proven that 95% evidence of uh, protection. So it, it uh, is gonna be quite some time before the whole population is really uh, been vaccinated and that the, the virus isn't spreading. And perhaps Dr. Rito, you know, we ha I haven't read a lot of literature about when that all clear is going to happen, but I would suggest that uh, somebody from CDC will eventually say, uh, you know, that the, uh, the spread or the prevalence or, or whatever number they're looking for in terms of the transmission is finally at a rate where the all clear is going to be given. But I think we're some months away before that happens. Frank, thoughts on that one? Yes, I, I think it's, it's important to remember, this is a, a superbly effective vaccine, 95%, which is, it's really a home run in terms of vaccine efficacy. You know, we're, we're really happy if we have flu vaccine that works at around 50, 60%. Um, but when you have an entire country and you look at 5% failure rate, um, that's still a lot of people. What's not clear is, does this vaccine protect against asymptomatic carriage? And we know that 5% of people acquire infection. They appear to be very mild, but there's, it's presumptive that they're still infectious to other people. So I think we have to be cautious not to let our guard down prematurely, and definitely not until we have a, a vast swath of the United States immunized. And then remember, we're just one country in the world. Uh, we really have to strive for global uh, vaccine deployment and global immunity. This is, a, we're all in one giant swimming pool here. You're not going to escape if you just hang out in one corner. It's a long answer to say we're gonna keep wearing them and distancing for a while. Yeah. And just people don't know, right? People don't know if you've been vaccinated or not. So as a courtesy to others too, I, it's important to, wear a mask so other folks feel safe. Um, it, so I think it's important for a variety of reasons. Um, so Dr. Tomlin, maybe the biggest question we're getting from folks right now is who's getting a vaccine currently? And um, people wanna know when they're gonna have a chance to get vaccinated. We've been receiving the same calls, Congresswoman. Uh, very, uh, very interested public about when that's gonna happen. Clearly we're in these phases and we're in phase 1A uh, which includes uh, you know, the healthcare workers that uh, have potential risk for exposure and, and um, the uh, high risk first responders and then those that work in long term care facilities uh, and taking care of our most vulnerable population. So those have been the priority, obviously, and, and that's where we've uh, been dispensing our vaccines that we've been receiving. Uh, and the governor recently expanded that to uh, another uh, tier so that those people that come in contact with uh, for instance, people in our hospital that are frequently in contact with patients, visitors uh, are also included in that. So that's where we are currently. And, and that's uh, uh, what we've done our best to try to uh, get that vaccine out to people. Uh, we've been challenged a little bit in terms of how you identify those populations, because uh, we, we certainly know the people on, on, uh, on the campus here at Evergreen Health, but the, the directive was to really try to get it out to others as well in the community. And so we've been working with that, particularly for those that, that we come into contact and know, and we've actually been calling different clinics that are uh, close to us that, that we know to uh, offer it to their staff. And uh, we're doing the best we can to, to make sure we use up all those doses as, as, uh, 
as quickly as we get them. And I think Evergreen Health has really done a fairly good job now. We're well over uh, 5,500 and, and we got ours a little later in sequence. So, so I, I, I hope everybody on the call knows that we're doing the best we can to get it out within the, uh, within the guidelines of the, uh, the governor's proclamation. Yeah, the, I'm, we had a question from Jan in Snohomish. I'm a healthy 60 year old, when will I be able to get it and where do I go? Um, so that's kind of indicative of a lot of questions that folks have um, as we move down these priority lists from the, the healthcare workers who are that top priority. Yes, in, in the media, uh, we'll, we'll certainly let uh, everybody know in, in our websites and other places that you can find at the CDC, DOH, when, when they start to move to the next phase. And, and you know, that really next big phase is, is the 70 plus year olds and, and then those that are 50 in, in uh, the households as described. But that, um, we're hoping that that's coming sooner, but I, I don't have really have a prediction on when the governor's going to move to the next phase. And uh, we certainly understand everybody's anxiousness to, to uh, get the vaccine. We're obviously big proponents, and uh, as soon as as soon as we get uh, more vaccine and, and more um, uh, opportunity in terms of uh, how we un, uh, give these vaccines, we're we're ready to go. Um, so, kind of following up on that, um, last week. President-elect Biden announced that he would not hold back the second dose of vaccine so he could distribute it faster. The debate has been, do you um, give out half the doses and then save half so that you can always have that one for the second? Or do you start giving more people that first dose, anticipating that the supply chain will keep that next one coming in? Um, what are your thoughts, um, Dr. Rita? What are your thoughts on that? Obviously, there are two different strategies at play here, and one is to go for complete protection in, a, in the high-risk population, the healthcare workers and, and the uh, individuals who live in long-term care facilities, and the other is to provide partial protection to a broad swath uh, of the uh, population. And there are pros and cons to both. Currently, the Centers for Disease Control has not uh, changed their recommendation, and they're saying we should continue to provide second dosing um, we anticipate starting that next week for the healthcare workers, and I know many places that receive the Pfizer vaccine early have already started. But I, I, I think it, it begs the bigger question. There seems to be a lot of doses that are, that are stored in refrigerators and freezers at a local level right now, and I think it's incumbent on us to, uh, to move those doses uh, into uh, people's arms. Uh, there's a saying that vaccines do not save lives, it's vaccinations that save lives. So a vaccine in a refrigerator is not benefiting anybody. So I think, I think we have movement uh, at, at the local level to process more of the healthcare workers, more long-term care facility people, and that will accelerate the movement into a, a broader population, those over 70 and multi-generational housing, uh, those with comorbidities. Um, one thing, it wasn't actually in, you know, a question I've gotten from somebody, but I thought you maybe you could highlight that the vaccine is distributed in packages that have multiple vaccines. So when you thaw them out, um, you have to be able to use that whole set at a time. Um, and so when you talk about getting in people's arms, um, can you just describe a little bit that you don't just get one vaccine and do it, that you have a, a set of vaccines that you have to use I, at the same time. Yes, that, you're, you're absolutely correct. The Moderna vaccine comes in a 10 dose vial. And uh, well, when you crack that vial, you, you puncture it, you have exactly six hours to get that vaccine into somebody's arm. And uh, there have been more than a few nights when we're closing down and we have three or four doses left that we're scrambling to call somebody to come in and get it uh, because we do not want to waste a single dose. But that also means you have to plan and uh, bringing people in 10 at a time or 11 at a time, just in case somebody doesn't show up uh, or having a, a resource where you could use the vaccine in somebody else. And uh, that's been stressed over and over again. Pfizer has five dose vials, but they have stricter storage requirements, minus 70 uh, and fewer days uh, at refrigeration temperature. So, it's a little bit of a race uh, to make sure you're, you're giving safe and effective vaccine uh, as well as to use all the doses appropriately. 
And that's why the planning part, as you were saying, is so important too, so we can maximize um, usage. Um, we got a question from Colleen from Kirkland, who said, um, we've heard there are multiple strains of the virus. Will the virus, um, um, I think it really is, will the vaccine help protect against all of the strains or are we eventually gonna need different vaccines? Well, currently, that, that's a great question. And it's something that's come up. Uh, the, the, way, the way you have to think of it is the, the tip of the, of the spike protein, which is the antigen or the vaccine component here, is like a fingerprint. And you can smudge that fingerprint a little bit. In other words, you can come up with a variant or have a mutation in the finger where it doesn't really matter that much. Um, but as long as that antibody that you're generating from your vaccine can recognize that fingerprint, you have coverage. Um, and so far it appears that uh, the variants are not, uh, are not having a significant uh, impact in terms of loss of vaccine efficacy. Uh, Pfizer has tested theirs and, and they feel confident that the vaccine will cover the existing variants. And um, Dr. Tomlin, we recently got this one and two, some medical providers have reached out um, um, who don't, who don't, you know, actually, um, where they've reached out to my office too, who don't work in a large health system or otherwise have access to the vaccine. So um, how do we work to make sure we're getting out to um, smaller medical providers, especially as we get more into our rural areas? A yeah, really important question. And I, I can tell you some of our experience. So again, we have limited shipments of the uh, vaccine. And so as Dr. Rita was saying, we really have to plan how we do this. So we look at who we would expect from within when, within these populations that meet these different uh, phase criteria, but that once we got most of the staff here done, then we start looking at the clinics around us. And so we knew that if we just opened the word up, then uh, we would be descended upon by a number of people wanting it, understandably. And we experienced a couple of those days where, where we were starting to open up and, and uh, people from, uh, many from, north of us to south of us that, that showed up. And so we did our best to meet everybody, but it really showed the importance of having a, a controlled flow uh, for who should get that. So we've done it by calling offices, invited them to come in on certain timeframes. But the big change that we really look forward to now though, is that there will be an ability uh, very soon to have online uh, registration for this. So so we, th those folks that uh, qualify in, in 1A currently will be able to go on to uh, not only the public health website, but then get referred to centers like uh, Evergreen Health, where they'll be able to get that and they'll be able to pick a time, uh, confirm that time. And that way we will be able to match the number of uh, people who are gonna get the vaccine with the vaccine doses we have for that particular week. So we really look forward to that. And, and, uh, and you know, we've been concentrating obviously around the district here uh, and, and there will be others that will be looking more in terms of uh, the, the more rural areas and how to do that. And so there's a, there's a lot of work going on, a lot of planning through public health and working with uh, institutions such as ours. And, and we are doing the best we can to make sure we can get it into uh, everybody. Thanks. Um... We have a question from Jeanette that says, I wish the Washington State Department of Health simply followed the CDC guidance. Um, Jeanette, um, I, it's a good question that, you know, why there are different plans um, in different states. The CDC did issue guidelines for vaccine distribution to prioritize healthcare workers, long-term care facility residents, um, essential workers. But um, states are required to submit their own plans. And so there are differences between states. I think um, Washington's plan generally follows the CDC recommendations, but it's also highlighted that the lack of a national strategy, um, not just around vaccine distribution, but things like testing and contact tracing where we struggle to have a national strategy. So this is an important issue and I think is gonna be critical, especially as we have a new administration um, coming in to have a national strategy so we continue to maximize uh, vaccine distribution so we're getting to every single part of the country um, and, cl and providing clarity to everyone of when that's coming and, um, and help people understand when their opportunity is gonna to come to get vaccinated. Um, I also, uh, there's a question here, a uh, concern I've heard from a few organizations is, is about building trust 
um, in the vaccine. Um, folks are concerned. There have been you know, conversations about whether you should trust having a vaccine or not. Um, Dr. Ridor, Dr. Tomlin, um, how do we help make sure people um, can trust the vaccine? Yeah, I'll start with that a little bit. Well, we depend on these great scientists uh, like yourself previously, Congresswoman, that we worked in immunology, but certainly over the years and over uh, more than a century of this science, uh, they've learned what, what is safe and, and how, to, how to do this in a, in a manner that with high quality, uh, without a lot of uh, complications. And so just as you step on, a, on an airplane, you, know, you trust that pilot and their crew to get you safely from A to B. Uh, trust is a really, really important part of this. And yet we know that uh, some of the most vulnerable populations that some have the highest incidence of uh, prevalence of the uh, disease itself uh, are, are some of those minority populations uh, don't trust the vaccine process. So we do need to reach uh, that population, all of the, all the, uh, those minorities particularly highly affected by this. And I think an effective way of doing that is by uh, working with leaders within those groups, uh, getting a better education process, working with the media and, uh, and, and showing the evidence and, and the statistics of the safety and efficacy uh, of, of, the, uh, of the vaccine. So it, it'll be a concerted effort and it won't be just one modality, but a very, very important topic. Dr. Rito? No, I, I agree. And it's a huge issue. I mean, I think many of us understand the science, have confidence in the science. Uh, you know, some people felt that this was a rushed process, but in fact, it was really a compressed process. There were so many cases of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection that you could you could complete your studies uh, in a very short time frame. So I, I'm not, I don't feel at all that this was a rushed process. I think all the safety measures were adequately taken. I think the question is how do you move from science to uh, sort of culture and belief and uh, confidence? Uh, and I think modeling behavior, of course, is a great way to do it. And also having community leaders, thought leaders, uh, uh, in those communities really step up. And I've asked a number of individuals in our hospital uh, who, who represent uh, people of color uh, to, to step up. And uh, they have uh, passed along the message, you know, one of confidence, one of trust. Uh, it's something that you build and earn. Right? And it's all well and good to say that every infectious disease doctor and critical care physician and hospitalist has received the vaccine. But there's a, a bit of a gap and, a, and I think a little leap of faith that takes sometimes a personal touch, a little bit of persuasion, uh, and just sometimes listening to what the concerns are. But I would really rely on, on uh, community leaders and caregivers in those communities to help us out. Mm -hmm. um, and for folks to feel free to talk to their medical professionals with any concerns they have um, so they can get that direct information um, as they're looking at getting the vaccine. Right. Um, I think it's, it's more vaccine hesitancy or uncertainty, I think, rather than just outright opposition. Uh, and I think there are a few people who would just never take a vaccine, um, you know, and they have their own reasons. I think for others, it's just a, a question of, of confidence and time, and maybe they need a little bit more reassurance. Um, uh, to get to the spot where they feel comfortable doing it. And we'll be there for them. And um, um, we also had, I think, um, Washington State had its own set of experts to independently review the FDA and the CDC, the, the Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control, the work that they did um, to validate the science too. Um, so a lot of folks have looked at it to um, help make sure that it's been checked and double checked and triple checked to help um, make sure that um, folks can feel secure in, in the science and what's happened, um, what's been put together. Um, we have a question from Sharon in Bellingham. Um, the question is, is it possible for Point Roberts to be moved up on the list so they can transit through Canada with fewer restrictions? Um, as some of you may know, Point Roberts is west of Bellingham. So if you go up, you have to actually have to cross the border, drive to Canada um, west a, a ways, and then um, you can drop back down into Point Roberts, which is part of the United States and Whatcom County and Washington State. 
And it's been very challenging for folks, folks in Point Roberts um, because they, uh, because of the border closures and restrictions, it's been hard for them to um, be able to uh, travel um, and um, they're a small community. Um, so not all, they don't have all the resources they need. Um, and so travel has been important and non-essential travel between Point Roberts and the rest of the state has been stopped because of the border closure. So um, last, I've been pushing the Canadian government to create special exemption for Point Roberts residents so they can travel um, that short distance through Canada to reach the rest of the state, even have them agree that they won't get out of their car while they're in transit. Um, we definitely need to get the vaccine out quickly and safely to um, help everyone in our communities. And as soon as we do that broadly, that will also help us reopen the border, um, which will have a you know in, uh, important impact on everyone in our community. So um, definitely understand the unique challenges that folks in Point Roberts are facing. And I, I know that Whatcom County put a ferry in place to help with that. Um, but we need to get broad vaccination so we can help everyone. Um, um, we uh, have a question, I think probably for you, Dr. Tomlin, what would be, you know, um, what'd be helpful to Evergreen Health and frankly for any other hospital in our state at this time? Um, um, we uh, have a, Julian and Kirkland um, said, What's the bottleneck in getting the shots into people's arms? Um, supply to the state, state to the provider, practitioner to the individual. That's a question. Um, you, um, it's important, um, but um, we want to know how things can speed up. Oh, yeah, so important. Uh, the uh, short of asking for people's patience as we go through the different uh, tiers and and phases here. I, I understand everybody's anxious to get going with this, but. Um, follow the communications, go to the website for, for uh, King County Public Health and certainly for Evergreen Health website and watch for the media when they open up these other uh, categories so that we can expand the delivery services. And, and uh, uh, you know, the other, the other thing potentially is, is we're just beginning in this. It's really getting going. And I think about the 5,000 plus that we've done, but that's really a small number for what needs to be done. So I think there's going to be opportunities uh, for the public to, to perhaps volunteer to, you know, to help as we, if we get more into a mass um, uh, vaccination service, so, you know, opportunities for that. If you've had a good experience, if you've been vaccinated and, and uh, you, you can uh, share the story that, uh, you know, I got my vaccine, I'm doing fine, I had a sore arm for a day or two, that those things help build trust in the vaccine. And the other thing is that uh, when, when your category, when your time comes, uh, that please get the vaccine because the, the more immunity we have, the, the better. Uh, Frank, your thoughts on some of that? Yeah, I, I, I think there definitely are some bottlenecks along the way. I, I will say uh, over the weekend, I calculated what we had and, and what we'd administered, and we passed out um, about 77% of the vaccine we had, and we were holding some because we knew we had scheduled visits this week, and our supply uh, was, uh, we knew what we were going to get. It was not clear exactly when we were going to get it. So the supply right now is one big part of the uncertainty. And, and again, this question of, do you just pass it out more broadly or do you wait and make sure everybody gets their second dose? So that's, that's a question that's rapidly becoming uh, a moot point as, as we move into the second uh, dosing timeframe. Uh, but I think there are some other issues. You know, clearly uh, Evergreen uh, Hospital can't be the only place to get a vaccine. So we're going to have to distribute the, the vaccination centers, make it convenient for people, get it out into clinics and make sure that it's safe there. Uh, I know Everett has been doing uh, some drive up uh, immunizations, that's a model. Um, and I think you can turn almost any site into a vaccination center with some support uh, and some personnel, uh, maybe having a, a group of medics uh, even using uh, National Guard medics. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of, of opportunities. And people have asked, uh, you know, how can we help? But the, the very first part of that is you have to have a vaccine to give. And uh, you can have a lot of volunteers that just standing around if there's not enough vaccine. And I expect the supply to, to open up significantly here in the next few months. 
And that the reliability of that supply, knowing that if not just that it's coming, but that it's coming tomorrow and you could expect it to come um, as that becomes more certain. Cause I've heard from various parts of our state too, people aren't, you know, they know they're supposed to get a certain amount. They're not sure when, is it coming in one batch or two batches? And um, it's hard to plan around that. So I agree with you that as we move forward, we expect that to become hopefully more of a predictable, um, predictable distribution availability. Um, if people have questions about the vaccine, where can they go for more information? Either of you have a... So I, I think the most reliable and broadest um, uh, source of information about the vaccines right now is either the FDA website. And if you're really a science geek, uh, you can even have access to the briefing papers that were handed off to the vaccine um, uh, study committee. Uh, Alternatively, the Centers for Disease Control is a great resource, and they spell things out very clearly uh, and in terms that I think that are easy to understand. Uh, Department of Health here uh, has additional information. I mean, there's just a lot of, of resources that you can access, and we'd encourage people to read about them. Uh, as different types of vaccines become available, it might, uh, might start to get kind of fuzzy exactly what you're getting and and so forth. So keeping track of everything is really key too. Be sure you get a vaccination card when you get your first dose so it's clear what you received and when your next dose is due. Um, I think we're starting to run out of time here. So um, Dr. Rito, any final comments you want to make? No, I just, uh, you know, it's been an amazing year. Uh, we're, we're closing in on uh, February 28th and which will be a one year anniversary for us. Uh, and I, I I think I stand um, uh, somewhat in awe of the response of our hospital, our community to this, and actually our state. Uh, uh, there's a, a statistic that I like to tell people about, uh, and that is the number of cases per 100,000 population. And overall, we're number five uh, in having the lowest rate uh, in the country. Um, and uh, I think that's a tribute to a number of things. Our excellent public health department, the University of Washington, which provided testing capacity early on, a really robust health system, uh, and a population and employers around here that recognized early that it was best to work from home. I think that saved innumerable lives. Um, School systems that shut down early before it was recommended and sent kids home also had a big impact. So I, I think Washington State has a lot to be proud of. Uh, and I, I think our behavior uh, has helped control things. And I hope we can continue to do that. Um, thank you. Um, Dr. Tomlin, any closing remarks you have? Just to add to what uh, Dr. Rito said is that people often asked, you know, what, what we're thinking in those early days, that we really could have been overrun and we didn't experience that. And certainly once we, to the good work that the team did in, in uh, the community and discovering and then um, getting the word out to, to do the important things of distancing and, and those you know, the things that were recommended, we're really grateful for the community for their response, just as Dr. Vito said. And then the ongoing support that the community has uh, given us over these 10 months uh, the, the team has obviously worked very hard at that time. We've continued to have COVID patients uh, through the 10 months, but we've, we, we've never really had a, a, uh, an amount that we couldn't uh, take care of uh, very uh, well with a high quality um, manner. So, so we're grateful for the public support and uh, just ask for their patience a little bit as we, as we get uh, all, all of uh, everybody from the state to the people that are gonna deliver the vaccine, we get our our uh, processes in place so that we can deliver this on a mass scale. Yeah. Well, um, thank you um, both Dr. Tomlin and Dr. Rito for joining us. I wanna thank everyone who's um, been uh, participating in this, uh, this Facebook Live event. Um, thank you for sharing your time with us today. Um, if we didn't get to your question, you can always reach me through my website, which is delbene.house.gov. You can also, as I mentioned earlier, find our resource guides on COVID-19 on my website under the COVID-19 tab, which will have um, updated information on resources that are available for to, on the healthcare response and on the economic response. 
Um, you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at Rep Del Bene for updated information. So um, thanks um, doctors. Thanks again, everyone out there for joining us. Please everyone stay safe, stay healthy and remember to wear a mask even if you've been vaccinated. Take care.